Good afternoon, everyone. I am Karen Dakin, and I chair the William Burkett Williams Memorial Lecture Committee. William Burkett Williams was a first lieutenant who served as a fighter pilot in the U.S. Air Force and was lost in action in Libya on January 11, 1943. His parents, Burkett and Edna, established a lecture fund at Fairmount Presbyterian Church to serve as a memorial to their son. The first lecture was held in 1952, and today, October 9, 2022, the 56th lecture will be presented by Professor Timothy Beale. We will have a Q&A time after his lecture, and there are green cards in the pews that you can write your questions on, and they will be picked up by the ushers um, and handed to the uh, gentleman who will be taking care of the Q&A for us. Um, so uh, I think uh, I'll now introduce Keith Mills, who is uh, going to be um, introducing Timothy Beal. <laughs> uh, Keith is a member of our Earth Stewards and has been a vital force in our community here regarding um, environmental issues. Uh, and it was he who suggested Tim Beal uh, as a speaker. So, uh, now we have Keith. Thanks, Karen. Uh, if, if I could introduce uh, Dr. Beale by uh, way of a uh, story. Uh, I, I saw some of my friends from, uh, uh, I think, Noble Road, and maybe there's some uh, Forest Hill people here as well. And um, way back when, a long time ago, uh, Forest Hill and uh, Fairmont started on the path towards um, her stewardship. Uh, it probably went back even further than 2008, 2009. In 2009, David Neff and I went to uh, Montreat to a, a Earth Stewardship Conference. And then in 2015, we found ourselves back at the same place at our Earth Stewardship Conference. And we didn't coordinate with each other, we just went separately. Um, I think somewhere in between there, uh, we did an Earth Stewardship event at um, Forest Hill. And um, I got to meet uh, the Reverend Clover Beal. Um, and yeah, I didn't connect up Clover and Tim until, uh, I think it was the summer of 2015, when um, Walter Brueggemann happened to be a guest lecturer at Forest Hill. And he, he says, oh, by the way, here are my seminary students, Clover and Tim Beal. And I said, wow. Students of Walter Brueggemann, oh my God. Um, and it wasn't until some time later that uh, one of our members said, you know, you're really into earth stewardship, Keith. You, you should reach out to Timothy Beale at that case. I said, oh, wait a minute, that's Clover's husband. So of course, so then I sent some uh, emails back and forth and uh, that started the started our um, path that, that we culminate in today with uh, Dr. Beale giving our presentation. Um, you can see all of his um, distinguished accreditations for yourself. Uh, I can tell you as someone that has read a lot of Earth Stewardship books and the theology behind them, that uh, there are many fresh things in When Time is Short. Um, and with that, please extend a warm welcome to Dr. Timothy Beale. Sorry. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Keith, um, and uh, the Earth Stewards uh, Committee, and thanks to Pastor Ryan, um, 
for hosting and, and uh, being a, a great new colleague in, in the Cleveland area. Uh, thanks to the William Burkett Williams Lecture Committee and especially Karen Dakin and, um, and thanks to Christine Winters who's been just great in putting all of this together. I look forward to the conversation afterward and, um, and I want to also say uh, hi to a bunch of my students from uh, Religion and Ecology course. Uh, I really wrote this book kind of in conversation with students in past iterations of this course and you know all the way back like four or five years where when I was just beginning to work on it they were like giving me advice and input about you know table of contents and stuff and early drafts of things and last year they read you know a rough draft of the whole thing and so this year they're actually reading it as a book but it's it's dedicated to my students in religion and ecology so I want to say that and, um, and, and say it means a lot to have you here. I know that I required that you come, but it still means a lot, and so thank you. And it's great to be here in Cleveland Heights area. Um, I wrote a lot of this book at, what, um, Big Owls, Luna, Stone Oven, um, In on Coventry, Tommy's, and walking around in the Cuyahoga Valley in those parks, and so I feel very comfortable here and happy to be back in this area. So when I um, am talking with students about projects that they're working on, I will often uh, say that, you know, you need to start working on your elevator speech. And uh, by that I mean like, you know, if you're in some context with somebody that you wanna make a pitch about your idea, whether it's a screenplay or a book or a grant or a, you know, a new technology or something, and you've got maybe just a little bit of time, you need to be ready to give them that speech that takes about as long as it would take if you happen to be in an elevator with them um, when they ask you what it's about. So I've got um, three different versions of, of elevator speeches for this book. One is the short version, which is three floors, one is the shorter version, which is two floors, and one is the shortest version, which is one floor. So the, the, the three floor short version is that this is a book about our denial of death as a species, about how religion has contributed to that denial, and also about how religion can be a resource for breaking through that denial and for finding hope um, deep hope as opposed to shallow optimism, which often very easily sl slides into despair, deep hope um, on this horizon of a finite human future. So that's the short one. The second, the two floor shorter version is that uh, this is not another before it's too late book. It's a what if it's already too late book. Maybe it's not, I hope not. But what if it is? Shouldn't we be having those conversations too? And the shortest version, the one floor version uh, of the elevator speech is that uh, it's a book about a palliative approach to the human future. And so I'll talk a, a little bit more about that as, as we move our way in. But I really want to say I, I believe that religious communities like this one and, and, and so many others, you know, really there's a real potential for religious communities to have an, a, a very important role, a very special role in the work that we all have to do. So I'm gonna read a little from you know lecture notes and talk a little, and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for conversation after that. And I'd like to start with a story that I tell um, in the book about our daughter, who's a good friend of, uh, uh, Ellen Roberts and granddaughter Jan Roberts in the audience, so that's really fun. Um, our daughters are, what, 30, 31 now? But this was from a long time ago, and, um, and it's especially timely because it happened in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. St. Petersburg, Florida has been in the news a little bit lately because it's part of that Tampa Bay area that really got hammered by, the, by Hurricane Ian. So I'm going to start there. My first job after graduate school was as a professor at a small liberal arts college in St. Petersburg, Florida. I grew up in Alaska 
and my wife, Clover, was from the Pacific Northwest, so Florida felt like another planet to us. But the school was a wonderful place to begin our careers, myself as a professor and she as a chaplain. This was the mid-1990s, but it felt like the 60s there. It was the kind of place where classes were as likely to meet on the beach or in a palm-fronded sweat lodge, which was a senior project turned sacred space on campus, as in the scheduled room, where the smell of weed and patchouli oil were always in the air, and where class guests often included a pet dog or a ferret or a snake. It was open pet policy. We loved the school's quirky, free and easy sense of community and its dedication to education as transformation and liberation. A little too much stuff up here. During our first years, year there, I would often bring our four-year-old daughter Sophie to class with me. I liked to sit on the table in front of the chalkboard while teaching, still do, and she liked to hunker down underneath it with some crayons and paper, peeking out between my dangling feet at the students while drawing pictures that she would give to anyone who seemed interested at the end of class. Sometimes, while we walked back to my office or to a nearby diner for a late breakfast, she would comment on the class discussion or tell me about a conversation she had had with a student. She was possessed of a disarming sense of assurance about how she saw herself and her surroundings, and she spoke easily and fearlessly from that place. After a class session on religion and gender, she reported that, I told Cindy that I know I shouldn't like Disney movies because the girl is only happy when she gets saved by the boy, but I like them anyway. After a class on apocalyptic movements, she said, I told Gunner that my dad likes to make creepy things interesting. One typically sunny afternoon, we were driving home from school along a beautiful tree-lined boulevard. Clover and I were in the front of our red Subaru wagon, and Sophie and her baby brother Seth were in car seats in the back. We passed a playground in a big public park where kids were swinging and sliding and climbing things while parents watched attentively from nearby park benches. I could see Sophie in the rear view mirror happily taking in the huge live oaks, the blue sky, the green grass, the frolicking children. Soon, she said, still smiling, all of this will be gone. Clover and I glanced at one another as if to ask, did she just say what I think she said? Perhaps that class session on apocalypticism had shaped her imagination more than I'd realized. Or maybe she had just heard one of our favorite songs, Pets, by the band Porno for Pyros on the car radio. It's a childlike, happy-go-lucky tune about how we're just like the dinosaurs. Only we are, only we are doing ourselves in much faster than they ever could. We'll make great pets for whoever comes next. Perhaps, but I don't think so. Rather, I think that something in the happiness and simple beauty of the moment awakened along with it a sense, even a vision, of the fleetingness of all that we know and love. I wonder, do kids have that sense more than we adults do? What if growing up is about learning to forget that uneasy, half-conscious knowledge of the unbearable precariousness of being human in a here-today, gone-tomorrow world? Maybe, over the years, we gradually learn to deny such mortal unease, building moments of experience into a big story, a story of where we've been and where we're going, which provides a kind of narrative bridge to block our view of the abyss we daily cross. Sophie was right, of course. Everything we were taking in as we drove along that day is now, in a very real sense, gone. The trees have grown, grown older or died, as have the kids and parents and grandparents. 
the playground has rusted, broken down, been replaced. And the Gulf Coast city of St. Petersburg itself could also easily be pretty much gone soon enough. Bordered by water on three sides, its highest elevation is a mere 44 feet above sea level. Much of the city, including that park we were driving past, is not even 10 feet above sea level. During our first year there, Sophie had already seen heavy rains turn our neighborhood street and back alley into muddy rivers populated by floating dumpsters, coolers, and palm fronds. She had seen floodwaters reach the door handles of our car in the driveway and fill the coin slots of parking meters in the nearby town of St. Pete Beach. When you see flooding like that, even just for a day or two, it is not difficult to imagine water washing the world as we know it away. Soon, all of this may be gone. It may not be too late, but it could well be. Not long ago, back in the 1980s, it probably was not too late. There were opportunities to slow, stop, and perhaps even reverse global warming. There was the 1978 report to the United States Department of Energy by a group of prominent scientists known as the Jasons. They warned that carbon dioxide emissions would be doubled from pre-industrial levels by the year 2035 raising global temperatures by as much as five and a half degrees Fahrenheit. This, they believed, would cause a rapid melting of the poles, triggering massive forest fires and catastrophic water shortages, turning much of North America into dust bowls. This was 1978. Then there was the study on climate change by a committee of the National Academy of Sciences, commissioned in 1979 by the Carter administration, but not released until 1983 under the Reagan administration. Although the report itself was bleak, largely confirming the Jason's report and calling for immediate action, the committee's chair and spokesperson, William Nirenberg, along with President Reagan's uh, science advisor, George Keyworth II, played down its urgency and stopped short of making any serious policy changes. Climate scientists had long warned that by the time we had clear signs of the warming effects of carbon dioxide emissions, it would be too late to do anything about them. Then, in 1988, it happened, the hottest summer on Earth in 130 years of recorded history. In June of that year, Dr. James Hansen, director of NASA's Institute for Space Studies, testified before the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee that the greenhouse effect of global, global warming caused by the buildup of carbon dioxide and other gases through human activities was a reality and would raise temperatures by as much as nine degrees Fahrenheit by 2050, if not sooner. The rate of warming, moreover, would probably not be steady and gradual, Widespread deforestation, for example, could speed it up as dying trees release their stored carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Senator Timothy Worth of Colorado, who presided over the hearing, said, and I quote, the scientific evidence is compelling. Now the Congress must begin to consider how we are going to slow or halt that warming trend and how we are going to cope with the changes that may already be inevitable, unquote. But even then, in the summer of 1988, more than a third of a century ago, it was not only already inevitable, it was probably already too late to do more than moderately slow the warming trend. In a matter of decades, coastal cities like St. Petersburg, Miami, Hong Kong, and London could be underwater. The world's ice caps are melting rapidly, many times faster than 100 years ago, and the sea level is rising. Eventually, it might swell more than 200 feet, swallowing up much of the world's human habitat and raising global temperatures to inhuman highs. No one knows how long that will take, maybe hundreds of years, maybe a couple hundred, maybe by the end of this century. 
And that's just one of several realistic ways our environment could wash or blow us away. Other possible scenarios include global pandemics, asteroid showers, and volcanic winters, to name a few. Not that the world would miss us. It would be just fine without us. Countless plants and animals would continue to thrive and teem. New forms of life would emerge and evolve. A, a vibrant and diverse post-human planet is a very real possibility. Indeed, sooner or later, it is an inevitability. The end of the world as we know it, that is, as a home for human life and society in any form that remotely resembles anything we have known, looms on the horizon. But we have an incredibly hard time imagining that. It's as if we think there's some in invisible safety net out there. We may get pretty far down the road to self-destruction, but we'll figure things out in time. We can engineer our way out of anything. We always do. As the hero Mark Watney, played by Matt Damon, puts it in the film The Martian, we'll just have to science the shit out of this, which is exactly what he and his NASA colleagues keep doing throughout the movie, all the way to the final scene in which he explains to his future space traveling students that when all hope of survival seems lost, and he says, you can either accept that or you can get to work. You do the math, you solve one problem, and you solve the next one, and then the next. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. We can science our way out of anything, we seem to believe. So the book I wrote is, is about our, our denial of death as a species. As I said, it's about how religion, especially Christianity, has fueled that denial, and how religion might offer resources to help break through that denial and to live into our finite human future in a more humble, mindful, and meaningful way. When I tell friends that I've written a book about our denial of death as a species, they sometimes think that what I mean is that it's a book about our denial as a species of death, that we humans really have a hard time confronting the reality of, of our mortality and uh, that it's about how we humans tend to live in denial of our own mortality. And there is a, a really amazing, great book on that. It's, it's Ernest Becker's The Denial of Death, which won the 1974 Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction two months after Becker himself died of colon cancer. And that book's influence on this book uh, and on my work is, is certainly great. But that's not exactly what I want to talk about. When I say our denial of death as a species, I'm not only talking about our denial as a species of mortality, but also and especially our denial of the mortality infinitude of our species as a species, our denial of the very real and imminent possibility of human extinction. I want to explore on the species level what Becker was exploring on the individual level. What if it's already to slow, already too late to slow, let alone stop, let alone reverse climate change? Maybe it's not. I hope it's not. And I believe that we all should be doing all that we can so that it's not too late. Still, what if it is? Shouldn't we be having that conversation too? What if we, along with many other plants and animals, have 50 years, 200 years, or maybe, maybe even several hundred years more left? What if we consider, even for a moment, that our faith in ourselves to engineer or science and tech our way out of this is unreliable, perhaps even delusional? What then? How should we live? Only lately have some started to acknowledge the very real possibility that humankind will literally wear out its welcome on the planet. There have been five great extinction events on Earth. This would be the sixth, and the only one brought about by those being extinguished. On this horizon, new and emerging voices in science, philosophy, religion, and art are inviting us, sometimes pushing us, to imagine a post-human world. 
We are being called to recognize our place in history in terms of, and finally, we get to define this word for those of you who are wondering, the era of the Anthropocene. So we gambled about this, I, or we, we gambled on using this word in the subtitle of the book a year ago about how, how, well, how familiar it would be by now, um, how popular it would be. I think, you know, it's still not completely popular and well-known, but I'm just going to put out there a second bet on my, on my loss on the first bet that the year 2023, the, year, the word of the year could well be Anthropocene. Let me know. We'll see if I'm right. Um, anyway, the term Anthropocene was coined in the year 2000 in recognition of the fact that we are now living in a world in which anthropogenic, that is, human-originating, forces have as much or more impact on the planet's ecological and geological systems as non-human forces do. Scholars debate exactly when the Anthropocene officially succeeded the Holocene as Earth's new geological era. Some say it was the dawn of capitalism and European colonial expansion during the 17th century. Others say it started with the Industrial Revolution and the invention of the steam engine in the 18th century. But most, including a team of scientists called the Anthropocene Working Group, say it began right around 1945, with the first atomic bombs and what we now call the Great Acceleration, which was marked by unprecedented alterations to Earth's biological and hydrological systems, brought about by exponential population growth and the global rise of industrial societies. So sometime just uh, Google image search the word, uh, the phrase Great Acceleration, and you'll get a bunch of images of these of charts with these um, uh, exponential growth starting around the middle of the 20th century for everything from you know population to international travel to the number of um, of McDonald's there are in the world. Um, a quick internet. Oh, here I say it again. So I just said that. Um, you, you see this beginning around then and everything from urban populations to gross domestic products, uh, from great floods, flood, floods per decade to deforestation, and yes, to uh, the number of McDonald's restaurants there are in the world. Millions of years from now, the geological evidence marking this new era of the Anthropocene will be the stratigraphic signatures that we leave behind, the layers that we leave in the stratigraphy of the Earth. Huge deposits of concrete, plastic, carbon, and nuclear follow fallout. Such will be our geological legacy, our signature layer on the planet. Whenever the Anthropocene officially began, we are now in it, and there is no going back. Not only does this fact push us to recognize that we humans are now the primary cause of geological and ecological change, including climate change, it also has the potential to remind us that there was something before us, and there will be something after us. In fact, although we are responsible for the Anthropocene, it will outlast us. We will continue to affect the planet long after the last humans are gone. Recognizing that we are now living in the Anthropocene then invites us to reflect on a post-human, eventually post-Anthropocene future for the planet. And why is that so hard to conceive, so easy to deny? More than 99% of all species that have ever lived on the planet are now extinct. Why then is it nearly impossible to imagine a world without us, a thriving post-human creation? A big part of this drive to deny, I believe, is religious. By religious, I mean a very specific, highly distilled form of modern Western Christian theology, one that is rooted in a couple Bible verses taken out of context it is the theology of what I call human exceptionalism. This is the idea, 
or rather the belief in our godlike dominion over the natural world as humans, that humankind is exceptional to the rest of creation and accepted from the realities that the rest of creation is subject to. Human exceptionalism is our theological origin story, the founding myth of the modern West. It is also the unacknowledged, little understood, yet fundamental sustaining faith that fuels global capitalism, whose anthropocentric dream of infinite growth through extraction is driving and drilling us to an early extinction. Human exceptionalism unfolds, moreover, into other more specific exceptionalisms, and I talk about this a lot in the book. These include European exceptionalism, Christian exceptionalism, white exceptionalism, cis male exceptionalism, and American exceptionalism, to name a few. And these reveal the ways, I think, in which our ecological crisis is entangled with our crisis of democracy. As I argue in, in my book at some length, this religion of godlike human exceptionalism is a modern invention. It's not good Bible. However biblical or Christian it claims to be, this worldview would have been alien and unbelievable to the traditions and perspectives of those peoples it considers its ancestors. I want to recover those earlier traditions and perspectives in biblical tradition, as well as traces of even earlier indigenous religious cultures behind those traditions in our scriptures. In so doing, I hope to unread them from the perspective of the dominion delusion they've been forced to serve and to reread them for what insights they might have to offer us today. Far from promoting godlike human exceptionalism, Many of these scriptural traditions, I find, are closer to what the Buddhist poet and environmental philosopher activist Gary Snyder calls the practice of the wild than modern Christianity has been able to recognize. This is largely because modern Christianity has taken such pains to try to distance its inherited traditions, scriptures, its scriptures, from other so-called primitive indigenous religions, and we need to reconnect those things. We did a little bit of that in adult ed this morning, going back and looking at the, the early Genesis uh, creation stories. It was a great conversation. While working on this book, I've had a playlist of songs on heavy rotation. Many were first shared with me by students and friends at different stages of my work and have become so integrated with this project that I no longer know them apart from this project. Many of you will understand that, and indeed I think probably for many of you, seeing the playlist could be more revealing of what this book is about than any written uh, lecture I could give today. And by the way, you can find it on, well, there's a Spotify version just called Finding Our Way in the Anthropocene, but there, if you just search, um, you can find a, a YouTube site that has found live performances of all of the songs from it that someone put together, which is really awesome. I encourage you to have a look. One song that has really haunted me throughout my, my work is the vaguely mournful, dully apologetic O oh Children by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, which many of you know from the Harry Potter <laughs> reappearance of it. It's a kind of goodbye note from an older generation to their survivors, the children, whom they've left with an awful mess. In a mix of remorse and resignation, Cave asks for their forgiveness for what began, naively enough, as a little fun, but has become a nightmare that they will be left to inhabit. And now, as the elders depart this gulag of violence, injustice, and degradation, they are leaving the children the keys. It's as if, in the same moment, we, the older generation, are realizing both the disaster we've left for our children and the fact that it's too late to do much about it. The older I get, the more O oh, Children resonates. I feel the sadness and regret and I feel a kind of weariness, too, weary of my own inaction, exhausted by my own lack of wholeheartedness, depressed by my own part in our failure 
to the next generation. And I believe that younger people are also weary. I've learned this from my students and my own kids. But theirs is a weariness infused with frustration, even rage, sick and tired. This is what I have learned. They have grown up fully aware and terrified of the ecological crisis they find themselves in. For many of them, anxiety and climate trauma are a part of everyday life. They have heard the deadlines come and go for the point at which it will be too late to reverse or even significantly slow global warming. They have heard leader after leader of every political and religious stripe promise to address it and then fail to do so. They do not easily imagine or anticipate grandchildren, let alone great-grandchildren, as my generation and earlier ones did. Indeed, many cannot imagine having kids of their own. These young people also recognize the denial that has gotten us to this place. They see it in their own parents and grandparents, not to mention professors, and they worry that in time they themselves will learn to practice the same denial. What to do? Ask for forgiveness and hand them the keys to our broken down immortality vehicles before we run away? Oh, children. I first tried to write this book uh, as a, a letter to my own children, also as a letter to my imagined daughter's great-granddaughter, um, and then as a letter to, to my own students, actually, a uh, kind of long-form version of the Nick Cave song, I guess you could say. But that really didn't make sense to me because it's not something I'm I'm telling them or writing to them. Rather, it's something I've been thinking and talking about with them, with, with you all, um, for a long time. So I really tried, to, tried to, to do this work as a continuation, really a next round of those conversations for which I continue to be grateful and in which I continue to find hope. I, um, I, I want these conversations to begin not with delusions of godlikeness and human transcendence and not with a kind of problem-solving orientation, but with a call to what I call subsendence. That is, a call to ground ourselves in what I think of as our earth creatureliness. We talked about this, that this morning in, in class. To find ourselves in, with, and under the web of interdependence that cradles our being. So for me, the, the, the shape of that conversation and, and really the, what I tried to make the shape of the book too is, is a kind of arc or a movement from reality to grief to hope, um, to confront the ideology of human exceptionalism with the reality of the bed that we have made for ourselves and for others, to confront the denial that follows from that ideology um, with real grief, giving voice to grief for, for, for the harm that's already been done, for the harm that we know is coming, that we can't undo, even if the effects of it haven't arrived yet, um, to confront denial with grief, and then to confront also the despair, which is inevitably what that denial turns into in that ideology denial the third movement in that narrative arc is despair, to confront that despair with, with, with real hope, with meaningful, deep hope. Um, I don't think that you can get to hope without grief. I write a lot about that. I, I've learned from my teacher, Walter Brueggemann, um, uh, uh, that, that hard lesson, um, that, uh, yeah, that we can't get to real hope without, without giving voice to grief. And I want to be clear that, that a hope is not the same as optimism. Um, I, I, I've had a lot of people, when I give them one of those elevator speeches about the book, respond immediately with, well, I choose to be an optimist. And when I hear that, I think, you're telling me you're choosing not to think about it, really, right? Um, that it, it really is a kind, of, a, a, a kind of denial. It's an opting um, not, to, not to face and address and grieve and find real hope. Hope is, hope is deep, hope is costly, 
Optimism is shallow. Optimism is cheap. Uh, it's addictive. It's a quick high, but it slides into a really nasty hangover of despair um, very easily and quickly. So um, for me, what that means, and this is getting to the palliative part now, um, is that, that this hope that we need to work on has to be a kind of, in some sense, a, a palliative kind of hope. And when I say that, um, sometimes I think people think I mean by palliative, basically like giving up, shutting down, turning up the morphine drip, you know, to kind of calm the, the anxiety and make the pain go away for these last few moments before, or days or hours before it's over. And that's not in any way, shape, or form what I'm talking about. In fact, quite the opposite. I think a palliative approach in healthcare is not about giving up or giving in. It's not the same as what sometimes we mean by hospice, which is right toward the end, and it is, you know, I've, I've been part of that, and it, you know, morphine can really help in that. But it's not about anesthetizing uh, anxiety and pain. On the contrary, a palliative approach um, is always about living meaningfully and hopefully when you can no longer deny that in all likelihood, time is growing relatively short, that you've got a relatively short off-ramp um, that you're looking at, right? Uh, it's, it's really about, and, that, and we might be talking about months, we might be talking about years, we might be talking about decades even. That's not what matters. What matters in a palliative approach to individual health care is focusing on quality of life rather than on quantity of days or years by any means necessary, by any expense necessary. So what would a palliative approach to the human future look like? To be sure, it's not a direct translation. Um, among other things, we're talking about very different scales, right? It's not about uh, individual uh, an, an individual, but about humankind and, and human society as we know it. And it's not about um, days or months or years for an individual, but we're talking about decades or generations or maybe even centuries. Still, how might the wisdom of palliative care for individuals be instructive for us in relation to a finite human future? And I draw um, a lot from the, from the really amazing work of um, B.J. Miller. I'd encourage you to check out his TED Talk. Um, I forget what it's called, but if you type his B.J. Miller and palliative or hospice in there, you'll get it. And also Atul Gawande, uh, Being Mortal, that amazing book. Um, but uh, anyway, so uh, I see three ways in which the wisdom of palliative care could be instructive for us in thinking about a kind, something like a palliative approach to the, to the human future. First, a palliative approach to individual care focuses on sorting out, on the one hand, unnecessary suffering, which we can and should work to alleviate, and on the other hand, necessary or unavoidable suffering, which we must accept and learn to live with. So when I translate that to a palliative approach to the human future, that means, uh, for one thing, acknowledging, grieving, and working to alleviate the suffering and harm that has already been done and the suffering and harm that we can already see is coming, especially for those who already suffer inequitably as a result of economic, racial, and gender disparities. We need to invest our resources in reducing the suffering already being caused, anticipating what further harm is coming, and investing in alleviating what can be alleviated. And it's really interesting, I, I read a piece that was a while ago, maybe a few months ago now, in the New York Times Climate Watch about uh, Gen Z climate activists. And there's indication that there's a little bit of a shift in terms of the focus of the work, the climate activism work that Gen Z uh, 
folks are doing as opposed to the work that was being done by earlier generations. And a lot more of it is focused on climate justice. A lot more of it is focused on the effects that we're already seeing um, rather than you know, being focused entirely on reversing or slowing you know, uh, climate change and global warming. I think that's really significant. Uh, it could also mean uh, reconsidering some of our extremely expensive, long shot, I would say optimistic, often denial driven kind of we can beat this ventures that are, are very expensive. And the, the analogy, that, this is a little bit extreme, but the analogy that comes to mind is um, Elon Musk's, Elon Musk's um, SpaceX, right? So, but you could replace that with Jeff Bezos's space thing or um, Mark Zuckerberg's or whoever. But um, so, you know, imagine you're, you're talking about a person with maybe, you know, a, a, a six months to live and there's this surgery, this procedure they could do. It's incredibly expensive. It's going to cost all of this person's savings. It's going to break his family. It's going to probably cause a lot of pain and suffering. He might not even be conscious for the months while he's going through this procedure. A lot of discomfort, a lot of pain, pain for the family. It's going to be tough on the insurance system. Um, and it has a point five percent chance of adding an extra one to two months to those six months. To me, that's what SpaceX is. That's what <laughs> that program is. Really expensive, so many other things that could be done with those resources, and almost zero chance of doing much other than costing in all kinds of ways, everything from planetary costs in terms of extraction and and, and labor and so forth to, uh, to actual monetary um, economic costs. So a second denying, so that's the first, is uh, learning how to live with necessary suffering, working to alleviate unnecessary suffering. A second design cue we can take from individual palliative care is to focus on relationships. When an individual recognizes that time is short, whether a month or a year or 10 years, they often seek to renew restore, repair relationships with family members, friends, and others. They seek forgiveness or to forgive. They want to make right with others they've wronged. So for me, translating this into a palliative approach to the human future, we should work on repairing and restoring community, on making right, on striving for greater equity and social justice, and dare I say, reparations. Even if we had only one day left on the planet, I think this is, worth, this is work worth doing. A third design cue comes from palliative care's focus on connecting the individual with the world through the senses, that is, on embodied pleasure, wonder, and joy. And this one is really both individual and collective work, I think. The paradox here is that by focusing on our own individual bodily experiences, we become more open and vulnerable to the world around us and more connected. For me, this, this translates into a palliative approach to the human future in terms of our much needed personal and communal work. Really, it's personal work in community in many ways, but this work of connecting or reconnecting our embodied selves with the rest of the natural world, from animals to trees to rocks and streams, to stop trying to transcend our bodily existence, which is our delusional attempt to solve for mortality, that, that effort to transcend biology, and instead to let ourselves subsend, to come down from our throne of godlike sovereignty and human exceptionalism, to get closer to the ground, literally, to lower ourselves on the food chain, to experience our vulnerability, our fragility, our creaturely smallness in relation to the wild world that we are part of. This is what Buddhist poet uh, Gary Snyder, I mentioned him earlier, calls the, pra the practice of the wild, about wandering off the road, even off the trail, even getting a little lost in order to find ourselves as part of a shimmering web of interdependence and what Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing. 
And in the book, I, I talk about this as, as earth creatureliness. We talked about that this morning, too. So much of our culture is built on denial of our earth creatureliness. We are almost proud of our nature illiteracy. I would suggest that we will not be able, and this is important for me, I will suggest that we will not be able to do good, meaningful, hopeful work in the face of climate justice challenges, climate crisis, even ecological collapse, without getting back in touch with, even falling in love again with, our humble creatureliness. So I'd like to conclude with uh, something of a call. Uh, I've come to believe that religious communities, like this one, have a very important leadership role in the work that lies ahead. Religious communities carry in their traditions a treasure trove of resources, beliefs, and practices that can help people to face and give voice to pain, loss, trauma, fear, and death, to share the weight of those experiences with others, and to find genuine meaning and hope in and through that process. Religious communities can help us all accept, understand, and embrace the reality of death that is part, the reality that death is part of life, to remind us that we come from the earth and return to it. That's right out of Ash Wednesday, right? Remember that you are dust and that to dust you shall return. Um, to remember that as the poet, the German poet Rainer Maria Rilke put it, impermanence is the very fragrance of our days. Religious communities like this one have the capacity and potential to create and hold space for communities of belonging which can help us to face the reality of the bed we have made for ourselves and others, to grieve the harm it has caused and already and will cause, and to find hope, real hope, as opposed to shallow optimism, to begin to imagine alternative futures on the horizon of the Anthropocene. Whether we have a generation or seven generations or even more, whether there is still time before it's too late or it is already too late, what matters most when time becomes short is always what matters most. Thank you. I think we've got a, a, a system here that's going to kick in. I hope we have a system. Uh, could you, uh, if you have written any of the uh, of questions on those green cards, please pass them forward. Anybody else? All right. Should I just stand here? Is this good? Sure. Okay. Uh, this is uh, this is a good one. <laughs> you bring up quote constructive Christian echo theology in relation to Dorothy Dean. Ah, uh, yeah. Please expand on this. Is it a movement? Do you see other theologians speaking out like you are? Mm. Thank you. Yes, in fact, I think our, um, the, the students here are gonna read that Dorothy Dean article next week. <laughs> so um, uh, we do a little bit of work around progressive uh, eco-feminist Christian theology, and Dorothy Dean is a great um, uh, young example. She um, is a student, I believe, of Sally McFaig. Some of you may know the work of, of eco-feminist theologian Sally McFaig, and, and in a way that's to say, yes, that, that is a thriving movement and has been around long enough that 
There are folks like uh, Sally McFaig and Thomas Berry who have been doing this work since the, the 70s and the 80s at least. Um, and uh, I'd say it's a growing movement. Um, it, it's, and I'm, I'm, I guess I do do theology um, in the book. I'm not, I'm not a card-carrying theologian. My PhD is in, in Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, but, but um, I'm a lay theologian, I guess. Um, but they're, 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 I think that we're in an interesting place in that, on that horizon of progressive Christian eco-theology in that we're, like me, we're starting to move in this, this direction of thinking about a finite human future. And what does, what does that mean theologically um, in a tradition that we were talking, Professor Kim, this morning about this, that, that has some, some very deeply um, embedded uh, concepts around, you know, things like eternity and the soul and so forth. What does it, uh, and, and, and ideas of creation that really hold the human as, as central. Um, you know, in the story of creation, even what we call um, process theology, which began really with uh, the French physicist theologian Thierry de Chardin, really saw the human part in this galactic story as as central, the, the kind of Christ consciousness that 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 we carry as part of that story. So, I think there are a lot of people doing that work. Um, uh, I, I uh, have a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation to put together a group of religionists and theologians to start doing this work in, together. And part of what I, you know, want to do, you know, as I say, I, I want to, I wrote this book because I want to be part of these conversations, not because I want to dominate them or because I have certain, you know, answers to them or something. I really feel like this is an open-ended horizon in which we need to be sort of inventing futures we can't yet imagine. And uh, so much of what happens in the world of, of climate change, climate crisis, the environmental movement is a kind of more of a problem-solving orientation. And I am influenced in this um, understanding from someone named Peter Block, wrote an amazing book called Community, the Structure of Belonging. And one of the things he's saying is that as long as we're doing this kind of work together in a problem-solving orientation, where we think of society and the world as a collection of problems to be solved or to engineer our, ourselves out of, the only thing we can ever do is make incremental changes. We can only improve on, on what's already there in some, in some way. And so trying to find a model for what it means to be a community in conversation that's not problem solving oriented, but rather, you know, um, trying to be imaginative. And, and, and Matt and I were talking right before, it's Matt, right? Um, about speculative fiction and Afrofuturism and some of these movements, which I think are, are all about this. I just learned about another movement called the Throughtopian movement, not dystopian and not utopian, but Throughtopian. And anyway, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. And um, th there, there are other theologians, certainly be, besides Dorothy Dean, I highly recommend though um, her work. I think she's doing some of the most important work out there. It's not easy reading. As, as students will figure out soon enough. But it's worth it, worth the work. Uh, this is a comment from one of our, uh, uh, someone in the audience. Recently, I heard the following comment. The sea cities here in Ohio, which I assume are Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, maybe Canton, uh, they will be the ultimate climate change refuges of the United States of America and North America. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was reflecting on this while you were uh, uh, talking, and that is we living around the Great Lakes have a very good position uh, in terms of global warming. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question which uh, the questioner asks is, what do you think of that statement? And there's a quick note at the uh, at the bottom that says a quick hope that will slide into despair. 
<laughs> was that you, Grace? No? Okay. <laughs> no, that's, um, it's interesting because uh, just last week, there was a, a documentary film and discussion, I think it was called An Eerie Situation, but it was about some of the farming practices and, and fertilizer issues and so forth that, that are, you know, um, undermining that, I would say, optimistic um, idea. A little bit as escapist, right? The, what I hear is that my hometown of Anchorage, Alaska, where I grew up, and Decatur, um, or not Decatur, uh, what's the one on, uh, on, on, um, in Minnesota? Duluth that Duluth and uh, Anchorage are gonna be the, you know, the, the best places to, to live. But I mean, so one of the challenges that I think that question brings up, it's, yeah, it's optimistic for you if you're, if you're rich and are willing to forego other people's suffering who aren't gonna be able to afford um, property on, uh, on the Great Lakes or up in Anchorage or something like that. But, um, one of the challenges related to that for me is how do we um, how do we have these conversations with people who aren't don't necessarily want to and don't and, and won't have to for a long time. One of my colleagues, Sandy Russ, who's a psychology professor at uh, Case Western Reserve, read my book and she said, "You know, the hard part is that until people feel the pain directly, they're not willing to make that." palliative move. And I've been thinking a lot about that since she said that, and I think there's, there's truth to that, but I also think that this might be another role for, for religious communities like this one, um, and also for artists that, and I, in some ways I think of the best of religious communities as artistic movements, as, as, as a kind of poetry that's trying to invent or, or imagine an alternative world and help people have a different experience of reality that can help confront people with the reality. And part of that is is work that can that can foster compassion and empathy from those who might not be feeling it directly. And if gosh, if I mean that's what I want to invest in. I I, I understand that 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 it's it's understandable to be cynical about that, but I don't see any alternative to um, to that kind of work to trying to trying to do what we can to um, cultivate uh, compassion and love for for strangers who are going to suffer more than most of us in this room are uh, can you comment on the gospel of wealth and mm -hmm. to what extent does it still exist or is it a relic of the robber baron era of the what? The robber baron era? I, I believe Mr. Carnegie came up oh. with the gospel of wealth after he had a, some sort of conversion experience and he dedicated himself to, uh, uh, for the remainder of, life, of his life, to uh, uh, using the wealth he had amassed to, uh. Uh, for, to give other people, for instance, the famous Carnegie libraries. Right. Thank you, Carl. That you're such a good question asker, helping me know what that <laughs> what that was. A history teacher himself, um, right? Well, my first thought was more about prosperity doctrine and this kind of this uh, this gospel in in Christian tradition of, of kind of name it and claim it that you know as God's children were were to uh, open ourselves to blessing and that is all about material wealth, um, you know, all of that, but. But the, the gospel of wealth in that sense, um, I mean, I, gosh, I don't want to idealize Carnegie and his libraries, but, um, you know, at the same time, um, I guess that would be maybe the Gates Foundation today or something like that. But um, I think uh, my investment with what I have in terms of time and resources is more on the the local community level, um, uh, more grassroots in that way, um, but I think it's going to take everything. Yeah, I'd be interested in whoever asked that question, giving <laughs> their insight about it. How do you reconcile the role of religion, especially Christianity, in propagating a belief 
in, as you put it, human exceptionalism and transcendency mm -hmm. with Christianity's potential to aid humanity in the ways that you have described. Yeah, I don't reconcile it. Um, I, uh, I think that religion and Christianity included is always um, about interpretation. One Latin root of the word religion even is relegere, which means to read again or to reread. I think, I think religion is always about meaning making, and I don't think Christianity or any other religion is of one voice and one mind when it comes to that. Religion is also argument and contestation, and you know, the, the human exceptionalism that I, I described very briefly in the talk today, I go into really a lot of detail about that, about how these couple verses really in the Bible were drawn out by Francis Bacon and others and, and made to be the kind of you know flagship scripture for modern Western science and capitalism, which were all intertwined from the very beginning science and technology and, and, and uh, war capitalism, because you couldn't have all of the advancements and growth in Europe without all of the colonial extraction and war going on all the way around the world. So instead of calling that pre-industrial capitalism these days, we, we, a lot of people are calling that war capitalism. At any rate, um, you know, that, that's a very strong um, uh, uh, theological strain in Western Christianity that I think has become, as I say, almost like the unspoken, unacknowledged religion of, of, of capitalism in general as well. Um, it's kind of jettisoned the God part and other things like that and just hung on to the human exceptionalism part. But um, uh, I, yeah, I, I think religion is always about, ar always about interpretation and always about argument, and that's what I'm trying to do um, uh, in this book to a large degree, is to sort of read ourselves out from under what I consider these really bad and, and harmful um, readings and interpretations of Scripture and try to sort of, you know, rediscover what I see in there, I call it, in, I call it the biblical aboriginal, the, the sort of indigenous roots that are there in, in many places in these scriptures that connect up with other um, indigenous religious uh, perspectives and practices and, and can, can lend themselves to this conversation in different ways. Um, and, and that's, so part of the work is, is uh, getting in there and reading these texts and arguing with, uh, uh, with the other readings about them. I have just received a vital message from the people who are, uh, for the people who are uh, watching us uh, via the internet, and that you too can ask questions. And uh, is that using the chat, the chat function? And uh, we have a uh, very, uh, very brilliant man in the back who is fielding those questions. So, uh, 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 those of you who are listening. Please ask questions. And I will uh, now move to two separate questions which sort of ask the, the same thing. Do you have recommendations on how to preach and teach the, uh, your message that keep people engaged and also doesn't entirely bum them out? <laughs> Are you saying that I didn't keep you engaged and that I bummed you out at the same time? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you need better preachers, I guess. The second question is sort of follows on from that and says, says, this feels like going up and taking last rites before you try to be so that you become okay with God before you die. Mm. Wow, I haven't heard that <laughs> before. Well, um, you know, I think uh, part of the task is a prophetic one, and I don't mean prophetic in terms of future telling or something like that, but rather what the, you know, the biblical tradition of, 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 the, of the prophet is, which is, and I take that reality, grief, hope from Walter Brueggemann's Understanding that that's what the prophetic imagination is about—that the that the that that prophets are artists, they're poets, they're not future tellers, 
and first and foremost, they are artists, and what they are trying to do is uh, confront imperial, the imperial sort of narrative of reality with an alternative reality that challenges that, and that the only way you can do that is through art, through poetry, um, through language, and they do that creatively, but they don't, it's not popular. They don't always, um, you know, they didn't have big followers when they were around, and a lot of them got thrown in jail, and most of the time the king, you know, wanted them dead. So, um, so the work of the artist is not always popular work, but it's important work, and, and same with the preacher. I, for me, great preaching follows that, that, same, that same model of, 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 of making available alternative ways of seeing things. And so, yes, I mean, some of, like, a first book talk you hear from me about that is going to be more on the reality against ideology part. But, um, but I think that, again, we cannot get to real deep hope without going through facing reality and grieving reality. And I, so I think that's the work of, that's the work of all of us, and, and I think that preachers have a, a, a special... Um, challenge to to do that kind of work creatively and provocatively while hanging on to their congregations. <laughs> uh, this whoa, this uh, uh, this one says so. Basically, as part of understanding humanity as interdependent and interconnected with other animals, plants, and the earth itself, mm -hmm. uh, your findings suggest. We should be opposing whiteness and elevating the voices of black and indigenous activists mm -hmm. who've been doing grassroots environmentalist work as a component of efforts toward racial liberation. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I think that part of that, that, that as, I, as I said just in, in passing, but there's a lot about that in the book, I think that human exceptionalism unfolds more specifically in European exceptionalism, Christian exceptionalism, white exceptionalism, American exceptionalism, cis male exceptionalism, that these are, that these follow logically from that and that they are all entangled together. And yes, as that, that, that the work of dethroning myself, of, of getting off of my, my throne, which is human exceptionalist, but it's also, in my case, white exceptionalist, Christian exceptionalist, American exceptionalist, cis male exceptionalist. I've got all those tied onto me, too. And it's work around letting go of that. And I do believe that putting ourselves, um, uh, uh, that putting myself, I should say, uh, that subjecting myself and my bodily self to the natural world around me is part of that work. Uh, I, I, it's not obviously logically connected, but I think it is connected. I, th I think one happens when the other happens. This is the very first question that came in, and it is a little long. So, uh, side one of the, uh, of the card is, what are the essential attributes of moral agency? And uh, following is, are some suggestions. Is it the ability to make rational moral judgments in accordance with objective universal principles that the moral agent can defend in a dialectical discourse? B, is it the ability to make a moral decision by exercising free will without accepting conditions of such autonomy? Or C, ability, the ability and courage to uh, even engage in this, in a discourse with God. Mm -hmm. uh, on the second side we have, there are theologies and metaphysical views such as Spinoza's monastic metaphysics and Leibniz's view that this world is the best of all possible worlds. Uh, that entails predetermination or predeterminism also. Professor Beale, what is your uh, theology that does not destroy human moral agency? Mm. Gosh. 
flesh. Well, um, that does not destroy moral agency, whether that's A, B, or C. I guess the I guess the closest of those three definitions of or those three sort of descriptions of moral agency would have been C for me. Um, but uh, as I re- as I recollect it, but I'm again following from. Um, this Peter Block book that I'm reading right now called Community, I'm interested in um, engagement. I'm interested in prioritizing engagement and maximum engagement from, from participants in a community, from bringing those agents, those voices, um, that have been you know, marginalized in a lot of our processes so far, or even silenced or, or just ignored, um, uh, into the community, that structure of community, to use his subtitle, in a way that, in such a way that they have gifts to offer to that process. Um, I'm not sure how to translate that into more philosophical language of moral agency, I don't believe, my, in myself, theologically, and just logically, I don't believe in you know, any sort of sovereign human autonomy or free will. Um, I'm, I'm theologically very much rooted in Calvin um, and uh, that line of reform theology that um, theologically uh, says that we do not have even the liberty to, to choose autonomously grace and therefore that it has to be it has to be divine grace it has to be divine grace that's sovereign because we don't have um, the freedom to choose what's best for us ourselves so that's that's a uh, that's a kind of simplistic version of Calvin's argument of, about about why it has to be about grace and not about will and it's sort of the difference between the the Armenian tradition, the, the Wesleyan Armenian Methodist tradition on the one hand and the Reformed tradition on the other is an argument about how much free will we have. But for me, agency is always going to be within systems and structures that we're born into, webs of culture and rules and so forth that we find ourselves in as we come to consciousness. I'm really um, uh, taken by uh, the work of uh, the feminist Judith Butler around this. She wrote a book called The Power of Subjection, talks about how paradoxically we become subjects, actors, agents, uh, subjects of verbs in other words, uh, in the process of being subjected within systems. Um, And so there's a kind of paradox of subjection there. And I think that we all have to sort of work within these networks and spaces that we find ourselves in, within the walls we find ourselves, and, um, and find our power within uh, those contexts. I'm rereading uh, Octavia Butler's book, Parable of the Sower, which I highly recommend. I knew you would know it, Matt. Um, and it's, a, it's just incredible. I won't tell you anything more about that, but do go out and read it. Um, and it's really about that. It's really about agency and power and how to, how to work and, and, and operate in transformative ways toward justice within broken, and broken systems that constrain us in all kinds of, of ways. And um, uh, a quote from Peter Block <laughs> to, to finish, since that's where I started. Um, that, that he said, the essence of leadership is confronting people with their own freedom. Whatever that is, however limited that is, whatever spaces one finds some degree of freedom in, but I find that, I'm just sort of meditating on that quote lately. I don't know if I completely understand it, but for me it speaks to those, those questions around agency and power. God is perfect and created the world for us. So isn't it inconceivable that God will let the world fall apart on us and let us down? Yeah. Well, that, that's, um, I mean, that is another Christian narrative, um, another sort of grand narrative of, 
of, of Christianity in a nutshell. Um, and so according to that narrative, it, God never would. I mean, that's a rhetorical question when you set it up that way and then ask it that way. But, um, and we, meant, we were talking about process theology, which doesn't think that way about God um, and doesn't um, use some of this, this language that I think, you know, is very strong in a lot of Christian traditions. And I, I'm not, you know, dissing on it. It's not my theology, but... Um, but, uh, and it's not really the theology of the Hebrew scriptures, which are the main focus of, of my work in the book, but it's there, and I think if, if that's your grand narrative, then um, there's really no way, I mean, it's a, then it's a different kind of crisis that we're in right now. It's a theological crisis because, you know, the, 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 the real possibility of collapse is impossible according to that narrative, and yet here we are. What was that? Uh, okay. Uh, can you send it up, please? We are getting a little short on time. It's about 20 past 5 right now. Thank you. Thank you. For a Jewish tradition, the person must be remembered. Mm. What happens when there are no more people? Mm -hmm. if a, yeah, there's, a, there's some kind of a, if a tree falls in the forest um, an al a parallel there, I think. Yeah, well, um, that's terrifying for some of us. I mean, that's part of, of, of what we need to think about, not being remembered. Um, I would recommend... Um, uh, yeah, and yet there's also something I should say, at least for me, and maybe I'm just kind of a melancholy, mystical person, but there's also something kind of amazing and wonderful about losing oneself in something greater to the, to the extent that there is no longer, you know, an I there. Um, that doesn't, that doesn't, that kind of scares me, but also kind of um, attracts me, or, or I'm drawn to that. But, um, where was I going with that? Oh, uh, a, a, a reading recommendation, or actually, even before you, if you haven't read Joanna Macy, she's a, a Buddhist philosopher and ecologist. She's now in her early 90s, I think, and still going strong, doing amazing stuff. And um, she has this uh, beautiful meditation on all of the kinds of things that we're talking about here at, in relation to the death of her husband, who died quite a while before, um, quite a long time ago now, um, and how she understands that and how she reflects on remembering that and also some kind of an ongoing presence of him, maybe being remembered not by humans, but being remembered in some sense as part of this this everything that we're that we're part of, and um, because we don't go away, right? But at any rate, the the um, the the piece is um, a podcast conversation with uh, Krista Tippett, the show called On Being, and uh, it's called I think it's called A Wild Love for the World. But if you just you know search Joanna Macy Wild Love it will probably come up first. And it's just a beautiful, there's something about Joanna Macy that invites you into reflecting on some of these things that might feel sort of terrifying. And she does it in this kind of pastoral way that, that, that makes it feel um, like something else, something sort of wonderful and amazing. I think is this- Oh, I, Karen is telling us this is- This is, this is the last question? This is the end. Okay, uh, so last question. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Thank you, thank you all. There was much thinking going on in this room and um, we can't live without thinking. Your approach reminds me of the stages of grief mm. proposed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I, I read that a long time ago, and I'm definitely sympathetic to it. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, many have pointed out about Kubler-Ross's stages of grief is that they're not exactly stages. It's not like check that one off and move on to the next one and then graduate at the end no longer grieving, that we're always, you know, in all of, you know, in all of those stages and maybe more than one at any one time. And, and I, for me, um, that's the, the reality grief hope thing is the same. They're not exactly stages. We're, we're moving around in those, but so long as they're connected up, then I think we're, we're doing good work. But, um, you know, th this is something that I, I that has that that matters a great deal to me with regard to the ways in which um, Hebrew scriptures can be a resource for this work. I think that, especially in Psalms of lament, and in a, a few other places in scriptures, there are, there is poetry in there that gives voice to grief in ways that I don't see anywhere else in our society. Um, and, and I think that there, 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 is a, there is a resource and a model there for really raw grieving and lamenting that doesn't end with a, but I'm sure it'll be okay or I'll get through this. It's just there. I mean, it's hard to read, but this, this says something about that culture that it could include in its canon of, of, of rituals these prayers that are so raw and um, and so visceral, um, and, and that 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 there was this trust within that culture that the community could hold that, it's incredible. And I think we need to find our, our way to a, and that's again the work of religious communities to, to 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 try to be that kind of community that can hold that, um, truly honestly without having to say oh it's okay, or God's really there, you just don't feel like he is, or whatever like that, but to actually just sit with, with the God forsakenness, with the pain, with the loss. And then I think, I think something else comes. Thank you so much, Thank you. Dr. Jim Beal. Thanks so much for great questions. Thanks, students. There are a number of people I would like to thank on behalf of the William Burkett Williams Memorial Lecture Committee. Uh, uh, thanks to the incredible committee, which includes Joyce Pope, who headed the wonderful ushering team, and to all the ushers for their help with this event. Uh, Jeff Barnes and Carl Hoffman have uh, chaired the Q&A. Uh, Christine Winters, uh, Fairmount's communications manager, has managed the many and varied publicity and the coordination of many details. Kate Bolton and Pastor Ryan are also members of the committee, and we thank them. Uh, thank you, Jason Jedlika, uh, Fairmount's technology coordinator, and thank you to Jim Dakin, who managed the chat questions. Uh, and an enormous thank you to Professor Timothy Beale for his informative, timely, and excellent presentation. I want to thank all of those in the audience uh, for joining us and providing such thoughtful questions. Um, Professor Beale's book, when, short, when Time is Short, is available for sale in Fellowship Hall using the door on my right. And now, Pastor Ryan Wallace will give some brief closing remarks. Thank you, Karen. And a uh, round of applause again for Professor Beale. Um, Uh, thank you all for being here. I promise I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, my name again is Ryan Wallace. I'm the senior pastor here at, at Fairmount. Uh, and I'd like to share just one uh, a brief story with you to convey the importance of this message and a, and a brief biblical word also. Um, so when I was in seminary in my early 20s, I was very uh, environmentally conscious. I was, uh, I was a vegan. I sold my car to buy a moped. Uh, I t unplugged all the appliances in our apartment every time we left so that they wouldn't be drawing power. Uh, 
and I didn't buy any new clothes, and I owned two pairs of socks. I would wash them out in the sink and hang them over the shower rod to dry. I was trying so hard to live uh, this way, and then I'm in this class in seminary called Environmental Religious Leadership in an Ecological Age. Uh, and we read this uh, essay called Forget Shorter Showers. And you can imagine what it was about. It was saying, you can do all this stuff, it's not going to make a difference. The point of that article is you need to get involved in systems, in systems change. Uh, and that was a turning point for me to get involved. I, I became a community organizer and got involved in public policy for faith-based organizations, and that's been an important part of my ministry. Um, but, but that article shook me. It changed me. This book is doing the same thing. This book, you know, I came out of that and said, yes, I, I still need to live individually according to my values as a Christian and a human, but I also need to be involved in systems. And now I can say I need to live according to my values and be involved in systems and be part of this important theological, pastoral, uh, communal conversation about how we uh, do this together. Uh, and, and I do just want to, uh, as I said, make one biblical note. I think one of those prophets for me is Habakkuk. Uh, and I won't bore you with a lot of details, but Habakkuk is this uh, Hebrew prophet who knows that Babylon, the empire, is coming, and they are going to be destroyed. The Israelite people are, are going to be defeated. And he's angry with God. He's yelling, and, and he's, where are you, God, and why is this happening? Uh, and, and talks about they're coming to kill all of us. How long will you call and not listen? Uh, and ultimately what Habakkuk says as the Babylonians are coming, though the fig tree doesn't bloom and there's no produce on the vine, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my deliverance. And I think those last verses often get pulled out of context as just this optimistic, hopeful, but they, they don't come with all of the lament that are part of that tradition also. And I agree with Professor Beale that um, that hope doesn't come without reality and, dis and that acknowledgement of suffering. Um, and so that is our call to hold those things uh, in tension. Um, let me close with a, a prayer for us that's from um, our uh, Presbyterian Church um, Creation Care uh, Division. Please pray with me. Creator, forgive us for our sins against you and your creation. In your name, may we turn from our sin and work towards a new creation, one in which all creatures are freed from the bondage of greed and accumulation and are able to flourish into their creatureliness. May this church be a site of redemption, resilience, hospitality, and palliative care an extension of your love to all who are affected by the climate crisis. In this land, this structure, this community, this worship, may we love you more fully by seeking justice for all creation. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Go in peace.